So by now you guys have had time to read the, the title of the talk. Um, I'm talking about stalkerware and I'm trying to compress what is a very uh, complex topic that I could talk about for hours into quite a short space of time. So here we go. Uh, this is me. Um, the GitHub at the bottom is important because I have a lot written about stalkerware on that GitHub. So uh, I'll be bringing that back at the end as well. So I don't know if you guys followed the trial of uh, El Chapo Guzman, but uh, I did because uh, it turned out that El Chapo was giving uh, the the uh, drug cartel uh, kingpin was giving phones infected with flexi spy to his top lieutenants and his mistresses and his wife. And what he would do is he would call at an inopportune moment. He would call and he would talk to them briefly, and then he would hang up and he would activate a remote uh, microphone, basically use their phone as a remote microphone to listen to what they would say about him after they hung up. And this was his way of checking in on people. He also had a crazy scheme to infect uh, local uh, internet cafes around his, his headquarters with um, malware so that he could make sure that nobody was talking about him. But that's a different story. This is another case where uh, this woman had a boyfriend with a life insurance policy and she wanted to kill him. Uh, the problem was he was sleeping in his car at the time. So she installed three different stalker apps on his phone and uh, made the mistake of hiring an FBI informant to kill him. Uh, so this is another recent case. This is 2017. That's just to illustrate what we're talking about here so that we, we can see the, the seriousness, shall we say. So I've broken this talk down into three parts. We have defining the problem, the scope of the problem, and then what I think are a few solutions to the problem of stalkerware. So stalkerware basics. Um, stalkerware is basically targeted malware. Uh, you need physical access to the phone to install it. It uh, monitors and exfiltrates data. It stores that data on a server controlled by whoever makes the app. And the basic functionality is similar in all of these apps. So they collect your text messages, they like, uh, log your phone calls. Uh, they usually have some sort of remote listening capability. Um, it's fairly standard across the board. There's a few with more advanced features. There's a few with less features, but, but that's basically it. So there's a bunch of different names for stalkerware, uh, and defining it is important. So we have uh, mobile remote access Trojans, spouseware, which I guess implies that it's it's mainly married couples that use this, and I don't think that's true. Uh, spyware, which is a little bit generic, and intimate partner surveillance, which I, I quite like, actually, because it's uh, very specific. So stalkerware companies themselves describe their products uh, as child monitoring tools, employee monitoring tools, anti-theft apps, uh, some of these uh, apps can function, and they are called dual use apps by people who study stalkerware. Um, so you could use uh, Find My Phone, for instance. You could install that on someone else's phone and then use it to track their location. Um, promotional material for the, the actual stalkerware apps that aren't in the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store uh, often use quite troubling imagery. Um, they try to play up uh, paranoia. Um, they'll uh, depict domestic violence. They'll talk a lot about adultery caused by online interactions. So this is part of their marketing. Uh, I talked to uh, someone from Spytech, which is one of the companies that markets stalkerware, and I asked them if uh, I could install this without my wife knowing, and they were quite happy to advise me on doing that. Uh, they have uh, reviews on their site featured, and as you can see, the bottom one is he has absolutely no idea it is even installed on his phone, and that's the, the top review for their software. So this is a case that I was actually involved in. I reverse engineered an APK and found a URL for a subdomain of the Stalkerware app's domain. And on that domain was uh, 95,000 photos and about 12,000 audio recordings sitting in an indexed uh, directory with no login, no password to access it. Um, so I worked with Lorenzo from Motherboard, and we eventually got the hosting company to take down the site because we couldn't get a hold of the people who were actually running the app itself. Uh, so this gives you an idea of how much data is, is being collected, but also being leaked by companies that are handling massive amounts of data with no real interest in securing it at all. So when we're looking at the scope of the problem, I know we all like to deal in statistics, and uh, it, it's good for, as a metric. Um, Stalkerware is a global phenomenon, but companies specialize. So we have Let Me Spy here, which is based in Krakow in Poland. So while a lot of these companies might uh, produce, say, brochures in Google Translate different languages, um, in this case, Let Me Spy has an entire version of their site in Polish. They produce YouTube videos in Polish. Uh, they produce uh, blog posts. So 
You'll see that across the board. Um, Cat Watchful, which was back a few slides, is a Spanish company. So they do an English version of their site, and then they have a lot of Spanish content as well. So that's important to think about when you're thinking about uh, who's being targeted by this software. The localization is an important factor in that, and we'll come back to that as well. So this is Kaspersky has recently uh, decided to reclassify how they deal with stalkerware, and so they've released figures on infections. So they say over the past year they've had 58,000 users uh, that have detected stalkerware on their phones. Uh, 35,000 of those users had no idea about the stalkerware. We'll come back to this as well. And this is, for those of you who are wondering how this affects enterprise or your business, um, there was a study done in 2015, which is interesting, but um, to be honest, the, the figures that they're giving are not going to keep you guys awake at night if this is what you're worried about. About two in every thousand uh, employees of enterprise companies are infected with stalkerware, which is, is significant, but uh, I don't think it's, it's necessarily going to, uh, to keep anyone that worried about it. So when we're looking at the scope of the problem, uh, I thought that one of the ways to, to, to show this was to look at uh, breaches, because these companies get hacked all the time. Their security is terrible. So I've highlighted two in red. Those are the two that we'll be looking at the database leaks from. Um, you can see here we have 400,000 users, 179,000 users. This is a lot of people. Each one of these accounts represents at least one device. Uh, a lot of these companies, you can have up to five or six devices linked to one username. So we're looking at a lot of people who are infected with these apps. So we're going to look at WTSPY first. WTSPY is based in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they were hacked in 2016. Their uh, database included a lot of uh, user data, but what I was interested in was country ID, which I've highlighted in red there. And based on that country ID, I was able to get a hold of their registration page on their site because their site's still up. Uh, pretty much untouched from when they were hacked, I would imagine. And I was able to work out roughly where their main customers are from. Now, since they're based in the UAE and they market in Arabic, uh, this matches with their, their top 10 uh, countries that they're selling their apps in. Afghanistan, I was a little bit confused about, but um, it's also the first option when you when you register. So I'm not sure that it is actually 11,000 users there, although that's, that's very possible. Um, so that gives you an idea. Again, we're looking at 47,000 people, 13,000 people. This is a, a lot of infected devices. Uh, the second company is HelloSpy. HelloSpy is a Vietnamese company. Uh, the guy who runs HelloSpy runs about six or seven different companies. Um, and they market to, to different uh, areas of the world, depending. So... I'm not a cartographer, by the way, so apologies for the, the map quality, but um, this is a clustering of the GPS coordinates. So at the time of the database leak, there was 1,700 active infections, and I took the GPS logged for each one of those active infections, the first instance, as the point of origin. So they may have moved around uh, the devices, but this is the first time that they were ever uh, registered with HelloSpy. So as you can see, we have uh, some scattered throughout North America, some in Europe. Uh, South Asia is a hot spot, and we'll look more closely at that. Uh, this is Europe, obviously. Um, there are a few in London. There's one up in Scotland, um, and the rest are sort of scattered throughout. But when we get to Bangladesh, we can see that this is the, the main uh, number of users that were uh, active at that time. I've kind of wondered about this. I've looked for uh, specific Bangladeshi marketing that they've done. There's a few YouTube videos. I think maybe they're taking out Google ads. Uh, I'm not entirely certain. Uh, it's something I need to look into more. But it shows the localization that a Vietnamese company would be selling uh, to this amount of people in Bangladesh. So devising solutions to all of this, uh, because this is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, so first of all, we have antivirus. This is a really good paper that uh, details um, a lot of things to do with stalkerware, but specifically they tested the uh, efficiency of antivirus apps to detect stalkerware. And it goes into some detail as to uh, how good these apps are. Um, Eva at the EFF has been trying to encourage antivirus companies to take this problem more seriously. And I think that is having some effect, as we saw with Kaspersky. They're now giving a more strenuous uh, warning when they detect this software instead of just a sort of vaguely worded one that people might not understand. This is coming back to uh, Kaspersky's uh, 
statistics on detected stalkerware. Now, what's important about this is that when I first saw these statistics, and this was earlier this year, I'd never heard of these three uh, apps, and I had to go searching for them. And the reason I'd never heard about them is because they are specifically Russian. They're marketed in the Russian language and to Russian users. So it's important, once again, when you think about localization with these apps, that if you install Kaspersky and you expect it to, to detect stalkerware, uh, if these are the main variants of stalkerware that they're detecting, then this is skewed heavily towards uh, Russian apps. So it's not really one size fits all. I'd be very interested to see the, the detection rates of stalkerware that, that are more common in the West. So the main thrust of how I think this problem can be solved is through cutting off the money, as uh, simple as that. Uh, PayPal processes an awful lot of payments for these companies. They need to transfer money somehow. They need to avoid local taxes. Um, and PayPal is sort of a seemingly willing uh, partner in this. They're um, basically allowing violations of the terms of service by allowing companies that are marketing specifically uh, products that are designed to break the law. And uh, it would be, I think, very advantageous to cut off this flow of money so that these companies then would not have so much of a reason to market so heavily. Uh, this is uh, a spreadsheet that I came up with myself, which shows some of the main uh, stockware companies. And as you can see, PayPal is very heavily represented there. There is another talk on stockware later, which I would recommend that you all go to, which is going to deal more with technical aspects. And that is at 125. And this is um, my GitHub, as I mentioned earlier, which goes into a lot more detail than I was able to do here uh, because of time. So, does anybody have any questions? Do, do you not risk that if you cut off their PayPal access, they'll go to other systems which are potentially more anonymous or even worse security-wise than PayPal is? So that, that is definitely a concern, but I think this is sort of a crime of opportunity in my mind. Uh, so people think about, you know, maybe I'll spy on my wife, maybe I'll spy on my husband. They go online. They've used PayPal for eBay. P PayPal is safe to them. They're sending money to a, a shady company, but PayPal to them is something that they can trust. If you force them from PayPal onto a, a less reputable service, people are less likely to send their money, I think. And if you force them down to using Bitcoin, a lot of people are just going to not bother at that point. They're, they're going to be dissuaded. Um, you need to, to take, make the steps that are required for them to be able to install this app on their wife or husband's phone. You need to make more steps and you need to make it more complicated. So that, that's, that's my thought on the matter. Any more questions? If you don't get a chance to ask me a question now, by the way, um, I, you can catch me. I'm wearing this very bright, luminous shirt. So if you have any thoughts later on, please do come and get me. Okay. If no more questions, thank you very much then. Thanks very much, guys.